Hello everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Get Rid of Your Backup and Archive Headaches. My name is Loretta Baugh, I'm from Twin Strata, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Before we begin today's presentations, I'd like to review a few logistics. Our webinar will last just under an hour. The webinar will be recorded and made available for replay. Attendees will be muted during the call. However, you may submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat box in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. I'm joined by Mark Seraf, um, <coughs> Senior Executive, Business Development at CSO Inc., John Downey, Business Development Manager at Amazon Web Services, and Greg Ketman, Director of Solutions Architecture at Twinstrata. Welcome, gentlemen. Today, Thank these you. three gentlemen will discuss how you can use cloud storage to eliminate your backup and archive headaches. We'll walk through the benefits of cloud storage as a whole, and Amazon Web Services in particular. Then we'll highlight how to easily integrate cloud storage into your overall storage strategy. Finally, we'll talk about how some of our customers have simplified and improved their backup and archive processes as a result. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mark from, Z from ZFL. Mark? Thanks, Lorita. Just wanted to give a brief uh, review overview of uh, who ZFL is. Uh, company founded in 1996. We've been a global technology integrator for over 16 years. Uh, we have headquarters in Chennai, India, and our U.S. headquarters is in Edison, New Jersey, as well as having offices um, all over the world, really, except for uh, South America. Um, we have offices in EMEA, uh, APAC, and, of course, North America. Um, we're at about 5,000 employees right now. The majority of them are software developers. Um, we, in addition to developing applications for direct customers, we also develop applications for ISVs and solution uh, providers. And we've also developed uh, solutions specifically for the insurance, finance, pharma, and telecom industries. We've also um, had a storage practice in, in, in uh, in place since 2008. Our primary partners uh, in the storage space are Hitachi, Dell Compellent, Exagrid, and Coraid. Uh, so it's sort of a natural evolution for us to be involved with uh, Amazon and the entire cloud storage marketplace. Um, we've been an AWS partner since 2008, have developed a good number of applications for clients who um, have those applications deployed in the Amazon cloud. And as far as gateway vendors are concerned, TwinStrata is our go-to partner for backup and archive. We also are partnered with a number of other cloud gateway vendors. Um, Sonian is an email archive gateway vendor. Uh, Satara, Nasuni, and Panzora have a focus on enabling the sharing of file data across multiple locations. Um, the next slide shows some of our industry recognition and logos, customers. Every company likes to show those off. Um, we've been very active um, in terms of developing innovative and new applications, and we look to continue that. Uh, going forward, and in, in uh, particular in the uh, cloud storage space. So, with that, I'll hand it over to John Downey to talk a little bit about the uh, about Amazon and uh, specifically cloud storage. Thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Downey. Uh, I am a business development manager uh, for Amazon Web Services. Uh, I focus primarily on uh, our internal strategy as it relates to customers that own and operate data centers and how do those particular types of customers leverage cloud storage from Amazon S3. Um, so what we put together is a interesting collection of solutions that can do this and TwinStrata is certainly one of our, our go-to partner players in this space. So what I'd like to do is just give a little bit of background on, uh, on Amazon very lightly, 
uh, move into uh, some common challenges that most customers have with on-premise data storage management. Uh, and then I will move into the concept of what cloud storage gateways are um, while continually highlighting Amazon S3 and ultimately what the benefits are um, to end users that leverage this sort of strategy. So if I move to the next slide, and Greg, for whatever reason, I cannot forward it. So if you can forward it for me, that would be great. It, it did work, John. So um, I'm not. You're on the next slide. Uh, it's not showing up. It's not showing up. How do I take it back? There we go. Got it. No, nope. go back one. Okay. I'm not pulling it. Let me see. There we go. Oh, uh, yeah, you want to go, you're, you're not on the right slide. You want to go on the second slide. It's slide uh, nine, I believe, for you. Okay. So uh, this next slide, this is the wrong way. Uh, we have our, our, our next slide, our second slide, which we're not showing, which uh, hopefully we will, is a uh, overall um, market traction slide. Uh, shows information from 451 Group, Gartner, and Forrester um, as it relates to our position in the industry. Uh, when you consider infrastructure as a service, uh, the 451 Group is showing that Amazon Web Services has roughly a 60% market share. Uh, if, I, if I understand this correctly, if I can see this correctly, which I can't still see it, guys, sorry. Um, so we, we've, you know, we've been up in business um, since, since 2006. And uh, you know, in that short period of time, we've been able to to get uh, a 60 percent market share, roughly, in infrastructure as a service. You'll also notice that Gartner Web Services has placed Amazon. Uh, Gartner has placed Amazon Web Services uh, the farthest upper right of the quadrant. That's 2011. Uh, they just came out with their 2012 updated quadrant, which shows us um, even separating more from everybody in the pack uh, further up to the right for 2012. And then you'll notice in the Forrester Hadoop wave, we have our own hosted Hadoop offering for an analytics uh, platform. Uh, we are also number one on that list as well. So we're doing a lot of very interesting things, uh, and, and the market is certainly responding well. If you guys could go to the next slide, that'd be great. <clears throat> so the next slide talks about common data storage challenges that, that most customers deal with. And when you look at um, a, a typical storage infrastructure, for a company, um, usually you've got SAN systems for block storage. You've got NAS systems for file storage. Um, you may have secondary off-site locations for disaster recovery and business continuance, where effectively you're doubling the capacity and, in some scenarios, the cost. So you have site A, site B with replication going across. Uh, most companies are also, and you may have that for both SAN and NAS systems. So maybe there's four systems running just for file and block services. And then you're typically backing up file systems and volumes and application data using backup software, which is streaming the data off those devices to a backup target, which is tape or VTL. And of course, there's the tape machine to handle that. And then oftentimes, customers will take tape, ship it off-site to Iron Mountain. Um, and then oftentimes, customers also archive their data. Sometimes they use backup software for that to tape off-site. Oftentimes, they have active archiving software that pulls production data out of email systems and out of file shares and pushes it to another target that's actually online, right? So there's a, it, it's a complex, complicated ecosystem of stuff that, that's uh, expensive to purchase, expensive to maintain, and ultimately really hinders the pace of innovation for many companies. Next slide, please. So there really needs to be a better way to do this, and if you can click through this slide, and I think it's three clicks. Um, and if you look at going down each pillar of block systems, file systems, archival, disk-based backup, BPLs, uh, for example, and then the tape, the offsite tape, the replicated, it's just not, it's just not an easy uh, ecosystem of stuff to deal with. Next slide. So what we're proposing is the concept of integrating a remote cloud storage implementation into your existing operation. And 
when we consider something like this, it has a dramatic impact on the list that we're showing on this page. Um, because what a gateway does, like Twin Strata, is it enables you to host your primary volumes. As Twin Strata is an iSCSI device. Uh, it enables you to run applications over that iSCSI device locally in your data center. It enables you to run file servers, file systems over that iSCSI device. Again, this is a, the vol primary volume lives in your, in your data center. And that system is going to do uh, replication of old, all your gold copies of data and metadata into S3, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a minute, what S3 is. It's going to snapshot any changes and deltas into S3. It's going to tear out older data. So essentially, you'll have your hotter, more recently written slash re recently accessed data in the Twin Strata device in your data center. So chances are a very, very high percentage, if not all of your reads and writes, are going to come from that local device over your LAN. And you will not have to deal with any sort of WAN-based latency between S3 and the Twin Strata device. And because it's doing tiering, it's doing snapshots, which are backup. Tiering is like an archive. Uh, and it's replicating the initial gold copies into S3. You quite literally, for these types of systems, do not need backup software. You don't need backup hardware. You don't need tape. You don't need tape machines. You don't need disaster recovery data centers. You don't need archive software. You don't need archive hardware. And this operating system that runs in the Twin Strata device, and I don't mean to steal Greg's thunder here, but it, it collapses and consolidates all of those utilities into their own operating system and integrates S3 via API into their system. So they're an abstraction of, of the S3 API. Users of Twin Strata don't need to deal with an API. They deal with an iSCSI device, and they manage it like an internal on-premise SAN. So all these, these components get significantly affected from architecture to capacity planning. Um, you never need to deal with over or under provisioning, really. What you do is you provision for performance at this point, but you have an endless bucket on the back end. Um, operationally, you're dealing with just a lot less stuff from a consumption perspective. You don't really need to implement quotas on mailboxes and file systems because you really have a, a, a constantly flushing, never-ending back end. Um, from a run rate perspective, you're not necessarily doing these big upgrades every Q2, Q3, and the biggest in Q4. You're really putting this device that is sort of maintaining itself, and you're, you're just purchasing additional capacity on the back end with, with Amazon. Uh, from a return on investment, that's a no-brainer because you're just really purchasing a lot. And there's a lot less risk because this is a highly secure solution, and, and we'll, we'll get a little bit into that. So if you get to go to the next slide, that'd be awesome. So this is the, the overall concept of, of cloud storage gateways. And uh, the concept is, is block file archive backup DR. In your data center, these operations are going on. And instead of having separate systems for, for each of these operations, we can consolidate them onto a single twin strata device that lives in your location and presents those iSCSI volumes. And then in that device, in your data center, your primary writes come to this device. It's going to do deduplication. It's going to do compression. It's going to do encryption, where the customer owns and manages the keys. And then it has LAN acceleration properties as well, so that you quickly upload stuff in a data efficient and network efficient manner. And by the time it gets to AWS S3, it's a scrambled binary blob that nobody can understand other than the customer that owns the keys to the Twin Strata device. So, so this is kind of the idea where you may have a 4U or a 6U or a, a much smaller device in your rack in your data center versus racks and racks and racks of, racks of disk because now you have this never-ending pool of storage over the wire, which is S3 that you're securely connected to. Um, and then you have options today for, for S3. Um, and uh, we're discussing with many of our partners from an Amazon perspective the ability to also connect to Glacier, which is a new object offering in Amazon that starts at a penny per gig per month. It's really meant to be an archive tape replacement. Next slide, please. Um, not advancing on my end. If you guys can see that or not. Advance on your end? Okay. 
So I'll go ahead and get started then. So uh, the next slide is going over, and hopefully everybody on the phone can see this, um, is, is what Amazon's native storage services are today. Um, so we are really two things, if you, if you look at what we have within the cloud. We have an object storage system, which are S3 in Glacier, S3 being 11 nines of durability. I'm going to get into that in just a second on what, what Amazon S3 is. Um, it's a synchronous in, synchronous out object store, and this is what TwinStrata connects to. So essentially, through TwinStrata, your data would live on an 11.9's platform. Then we have something called Glacier. Glacier is, again, that penny for gig per month tape replacement solution. This is very new. It's about a month and a half old, um, and uh, that's a very interesting option for tape replacement. Uh, we have Elastic Block Storage, uh, which is our, our on-premises uh, in cloud, I should say, block solution for our own compute layer. Uh, so that has nothing to do at all with any sort of on-premises storage. And then we have our own storage gateway, um, which, which candidly is, is, is not going to meet the levels of robustness that TwinStrata can offer uh, from a feature function perspective, uh, from a disaster recovery perspective. So we, we do have one, but it's, it's an early release of, of our own product. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows where our regions and our edge locations are. So this is kind of a high-level overview of Amazon, where the yellow blocks are what we call regions. Those are, we have eight regions around the world. We have two in Oregon. We have one in Northern California, one in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Northern Virginia, Ireland, Singapore, and Tokyo. And with those little dots that you see, the little dots that you see are edge locations for our own CDN, that's a content delivery network, we compete against Akamai and Limelight, for example. Uh, those are edge locations for our, our CDN, and missing from this map are, are other concepts we have called Direct Connect, which enables a customer that runs a private network topology, like MPLS or point-to-point, -point, um, where you can physically terminate your network topology on one or ten gig ports in different locations around the world and have a private, higher throughput, lower latency connection into Amazon, which also enables S3. Next slide, please. So that's our footprint uh, of what we are and where our physical instances live around the world. Um, and then when you look into the region, those eight regions, which is slide 14, or 16, excuse me, uh, when, when you look at what a region is, a region is made up of multiple availability zones. So availability zones are clusters of data centers. And there's multiple availability zones per region. And the availability zones are typically 15 to 25 miles apart from one another. And they are all connected on private high-speed fiber. And what's interesting is that S3, which is, again, which is the storage system that TwinStrata connects to on the back end, S3 is a distributed software framework. So if you look at Northern Virginia, U.S. East, the upper left block, for example, think of S3 as being a distributed software framework that overlays all of those availability zones, which also means that it overlays all the data centers within each availability zone. And now when a customer writes an object into us, we will redundantly store that object using different algorithms where we, we essentially chunk up the data and spread it across all these facilities to give you this 11 nines of durability. That means that you can store 10,000 objects in S3 and expect to lose one every 10 million years. That's that statistic means. And in more real world terms, that means that we could lose up to two data centers simultaneously within a given region and you won't see a blip on the screen. S3 has been up since 2006. Again, um, you know, we have over a trillion objects stored in S3, and we've never lost the customer's object before. So a very, very resilient system. If you can move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so the next slide shows uh, the growth of S3, which I don't need to spend too much time because I just basically talked about it, but tremendous growth, um, really an exponential spike, uh, well over a trillion objects stored now. Uh, that's unprecedented, uh, unprecedented in the storage industry in general, um, as well as a tremendous amount of uh, requests that we get per second. We'll see we're able to sustain greater than 650,000 requests per second. Remember, we have eight regions, so um, a pretty, pretty impressive set of stats there. 
Um, next slide, please, which is the S3 and Glacier page. Uh, slide 18. So winding down, once you get the data into Amazon, and whether that sits on an S3 platform or a Glacier platform, uh, you actually <clears throat> you actually have the ability to do things with that data once it's in AWS. And this is one of the areas where Twinstra is, is very special. They've developed what we have what you call an AMI or an Amazon machine image. That means that Twin Strata and the Twin Strata operating SAN operating system can run in Amazon. That means that you as a customer who moved your data with a Twin Strata box in your data center into S3, that means you can light up an, a Twin Strata AMI, so you're now running a virtual Twin Strata SAN in the cloud. That means that that virtual SAN can look into S3 and actually access that data and that means that it can unencrypt, reduplicate, uncompress, and present the data in its native format to other Amazon systems, like our analytics platform, our search platform, uh, web services, our content delivery network, or perhaps you want to just fail over for disaster recovery and business continuance. Twinstrata enables that. They are one of the only cloud storage vendors in the market that actually enables that capability, and it is absolutely a strategic differentiator. It's great to use a cloud for storage and for off-site and for archive and backup, but it's very valuable when you can actually use that data for disaster recovery, business continuance, and greater business purposes. And then the last slide, uh, next slide, which is 19, um, runs through financial, operational, and business benefits of, of doing something like this. So, you know, as I, as I, I forgot to state earlier, sorry, uh, that we are a fully metered utility, right? There's no upfront capital investment required for the Amazon services, so you're only paying for what you use, um, which means you're really never over-purchasing or under-provisioning either, so there's less risk. Uh, and, and our prices do continue to fall. We've had over 20 price reductions um, since we came online in 2006. From an operational perspective, you're significantly streamlining and simplifying data management operations. Um, you're just reducing the number of systems and stuff that you have to manage, not to mention potentially data centers, because we can act as that secondary data center. Um, and it enables employees to be much more proactive on the business and, and innovative in general. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, capacity is effectively endless when you connect to the cloud. Um, so the business is never impacted by, by capacity that's not available. Um, which means you're, you're really never slowing the pace of innovation, and all of a sudden it turns IT into an innovation enabler. So it's, we view this as a very strategic solution for many companies. We view our partnership between Strata as highly strategic, and uh, hopefully you guys, hopefully this makes sense as far as an AWS introduction um, around S3 and storage and, and the world of cloud storage gateways in general. And with that, I will turn it over to the Twin Strata folks. Thank you. All right, so this is Greg Kepman uh, with Twin Strata, and I'm going to take you through the gateway portion of this a little bit. I'm going to try and make this real to you on how you can actually use all this technology in your own environment. So as you look, and as, as John talked about Amazon storage, S3 storage, it's uh, clear that we've got this very resilient, very scalable pool of resources that you can use, storage that you can use. So we want to be able to use that easily. And that's what we do. We focus on the easily part of that equation. Now, that pool of storage is delivered through standard web interfaces. So it's going to go over the internet, and you're going to use standard protocols, REST and, A REST and SOAP APIs to access that. So as John mentioned, within our appliance, those APIs are all coded up, so you don't have to think about it. Is what we become is a SAN device on your local premise, except we our back end is in the cloud. We look kind of like two SAN devices, a SAN to SAN replication where the secondary SAN is actually in the Amazon S3 cloud. So I kind of went through this uh, briefly in kind of my initial description, but it's an elastic supply. It's very large. You can get however much storage you need or not. Um, we can use this to simplify your disaster recovery. I'll get into that in a bit because I'll give you the specifics on how you use cloud array. Um, to facilitate that. John touched on it, but it, it definitely can simplify that DR strategy by making it very easy to gain access to your data from just about anywhere you'd like. It reduces maintenance costs because now instead of 
monitoring and managing a storage array, storage, now instead of that, you can do that through the Cloud Array Appliance, and you don't actually manage the storage. You just create volumes, which are a representation in the cloud storage. It is a pay-as-you-go model. I could create a volume using the Cloud Array Appliance, make it 100 terabytes, create that volume, present it to a server. Your online bill at this point in time will be zero. Uh, there's no data on the your, your volume is equal to zero. As soon as you store data on that volume, of course you will get a bill from the cloud portion. It's a pay-as-you-go model. And then because of this, it is a cost reduction model. We have changed storage from being a capital expend expense, a capital expenditure that we use to buy a bunch of equipment, and we've made it instead to be a monthly recurring cost based on consumption. So it greatly simplifies the model, greatly simplifies the management of the interface, and it also makes it easier then for you to afford the storage that you need to make your business run. There are certain features then that you're going to need to look at in a gateway. Um, Early on, there was a list of some of the gateway vendors. One of the things that makes our product, TwinStrata Cloud Array, unique is that we are a block-level device. Many of the other vendors are file-level devices. Um, with that in mind, block-level gives us certain inherent advantages, but that's something you're going to want to look at in a device. Make sure that it will do what you want it to do. Block-level means that we're going to mount using iSCSI. We're going to create a LUN, we're going to present a LUN which is going to get mounted on a server, which means we can seamlessly integrate into your existing environment, whether that be directly to a server, whether it be to the data store under the hypervisor, whatever the case may be, we can provide storage to that environment. And then it needs to be easy to use. Um, our appliance can be virtual or physical. We actually have a free trial, and we hear repeatedly from our customers how easy it is to use. In fact, they can sign up for the demo, and 30 minutes later, they can be up and running that. Anyone on this call right now, if you chose to do it, 30 minutes from now, you could be testing Cloud Array with live data to the Google Cloud. Data reduction. So we, as a block-level device, can take advantage of higher-level deduplication. So if your backup product or if your um, if your file management product, if it has file-level deduplication or block-level deduplication, we recommend you use those. And we certainly allow you to do those. In addition, we're going to add byte-level deduplication, LAN acceleration, and again, another two-to-one compression ratio on that data by compressing our blocks before they go out to the cloud. So that's very important, particularly when you take into account that we can, it's a cumulative thing where we can use all of the data deduplication that's been done ahead of us, upstream of us. You do not have to rehydrate the, your data in order to use our appliance. We do encrypt the data as well. So on our appliance, we use AES 256-bit encryption. And you keep control of your keys. Your keys do not go to the cloud. They stay on your appliance, plus we keep a secure copy for you behind your user ID and password so that in the event of a disaster, it's a very simple matter for you to recreate or regain access to your data. We have snapshots. Uh, I said we're a SAN device. For all intents and purposes, we are an appliance that is a SAN device. That means we do provide SAN-type snapshots, meaning you can take a volume, you take a snapshot of a volume. We, that doesn't mean we take a bunch of blocks and copy them somewhere. It means we use a standard SAN type of arrangement where we inventory the blocks that are in use, we mark them read-only. That's all we do, mark them read-only. And then if you go to change any of that space, we will use copy on write. In our case, we do this in the cloud. So we use a kind of a copy object on write so that we can keep multiple versions of your volume in the cloud. And John had talked about that. Now, with that in mind, our product uses asynchronous replication, meaning that when you write data to the local volume, we're going to do everything we can to copy it in the cloud. We keep 100% of the data in the cloud. And with that in mind, we're constantly doing asynchronous replication to try and coordinate and synchronize the data, which could easily consume all of your bandwidth. With that in mind, we do have bandwidth throttling on the appliance. And so therefore, with the bandwidth throttling um, involved in that, we allow you to control the bandwidth so we do not consume all of the user bandwidth during the day or whenever you want to do that. You can control that to minimize the impact. might be also done on a firewall, but you can do it within our appliance. 
Um, I touched briefly on the idea that we do back up the configuration for the appliance. Now, the reason that's important is that <clears throat> on our appliance, the appliance itself is generic. We have virtual appliances. We have physical appliances. That's your choice. The functionality and the capabilities are identical. They're so identical that if you buy a physical appliance from us and a disaster happens, your data center is underwater, you can recover to a virtual appliance. That's what John was talking about. Not only that, you could go to another site and do a virtual appliance, or you could actually recover in the cloud. Um, that's how consistent our, our model is, our appliance model is across platforms. Once you've stood up that image, is all you have to do is reapply a configuration file. Once that configuration file has been applied, your appliance will be fully functional. It will have made the connection to the cloud, and any volumes that you would have created before, that LUN will be presented again. So if you had eight LUNs, if you had 100 LUNs, we would again present those LUNs, and the next step then would be to bring up servers to talk to them. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. That does mean that we have instant recovery capabilities, because after a disaster, within minutes, you could have another virtual appliance up and running on another site in the cloud, wherever you'd like. Um, and therefore, you can begin your recovery capabilities uh, procedures, pardon me, uh, in that period of time. This diagram should look somewhat similar because it's vaguely uh, reminiscent of the slide that Don showed. So in this case, we're taking Amazon Cloud Storage and we're presenting it to servers as they uh, are there. So we can attach to just about any servers you'd like. Now, in this particular context for this call, we're really talking about backup, archive. Um, archive could certainly fit into the file server. We could be primary file storage. We can provide storage to your database servers, mail servers, et cetera. Um, that will be need to be more carefully architected to make sure we can meet your performance needs. Um, but again, in this context, it's going to be backup. So we are going to become the backup target. Um, and one of the points here is over on the right-hand side, you can see a long list of backup products. Actually, it is not a complete list. We fundamentally work with your existing backup software. Um, I'll go through a couple of case studies uh, to, take in to, to show you that in a little bit more realism. But basically, with your existing backup software, if you're backing up to, say, a hard drive today, we'll assume Windows. So you're backing up to an F drive, we're going to mount a G drive, and you're going to back up to the G drive instead. That's the only change you have to make. That's it. With that, we're going to keep a full copy of the data on your premise, and we're going to keep a full secondary copy. Again, in the background, asynchronous replication. We're going to get this out to the Amazon cloud so that in the event of a disaster, you can reacquire that data. So with that in mind, I'm going to describe here a little bit about our underpinnings. This is the only portion of this where I'm going to get a little bit more technical, but it's important to note. So within our appliance, you can actually support up to eight cloud accounts. So you could have multiple accounts in Amazon if you'd like to use them for different purposes. Um, each volume does not use its own cloud account, by the way. We can attach to up to 16 different servers and 128 different volumes. Now, each of those volumes can be individually configured. You want one that's one terabyte, one that's 100 terabytes. Our maximum size for a volume is 384 terabytes. So you can see we have an immense amount of capacity available. We need that because the cloud is virtually limitless. So we're going to provide you that connectivity. Now, on each of those volumes, when we create it, you see here I show 2, 4, and 10. When you create those volumes, it's just a virtual volume. Again, there's no cost to create any size volume you'd like in the cloud. There's no cost incurred until you start transferring data. Now, 100% of that volume will be stored in the cloud. Locally, however, we are going to mirror a percentage of that volume. We call that cached. That's typically done on a spinning disk. It could be SSDs. It can be whatever storage you want to present to it. In a virtual appliance, you're going to provide that storage. In a physical appliance, we will provide that storage. Not terribly important, other than the idea that it's a persistent storage pool so that when you do your local write operations, you write locally. And then in the background, we send it to a cloud. And what we want to do then is size that cache for your environment, for your use case, volume by volume, so that we can meet the needs of that. So for example, starting at the bottom and working up, in a backup environment, 
in a backup environment, you want your data on site. You want disk to disk to cloud. You don't want disk to cloud with nothing in between. So the way we achieve that is set the cache level at 100%. On a two terabyte cloud volume, we assign two terabytes of cache. We can do that. When we do that, that means that we will have one copy of the data in the cloud, and we will have one copy of the data locally. Even if it be your internet connection were to go down, it would stop full access to that volume, no particular problem with that. However, that's not the only use case. I mean, part of our discussion here is archive data or file server data. With that in mind then, those use cases are somewhat different. If you think about an archive model, in an archive model, the data change rate is quite low. That means that the amount of dynamic data that you need to store locally to meet your user demands is quite low. So we can use, say, 1%. So on a 10 terabyte volume in the cloud, we can back that with 100 gig locally, and yet all those local files, all the directory structure, everything you need, the end user is going to see a 10 terabyte volume, and yet 99% of that volume is going to reside in the cloud, and it's completely transparent to the end user. That's a very powerful way to expand your local environment and utilize Amazon storage in your day-to-day -day usage. A file server is the exact same equation, except that industry statistics didn't say that about 10% of a typical file server volume is dynamic data. The other 90% is static data or empty space. Well, then I can back it with a 10% cache. So you create these volumes using templates. It's very easy. You create these volumes, you assign the cache levels to them, and then you can deploy that volume to your environment. And if you decide that 10% cache is not enough, you need 15, well, add more. You can do it any time you'd like to an online volume. That's no particular problem to us. So one of the things we talked about is the disaster recovery capabilities. This diagram is to illustrate that a little bit. The reason we're copying the data off-site is so that when something bad happens, we can gain access to it. And the first part we have easily covered. In column one is all you have to do is recover cloud array. Well, with that in mind, we do have this DR Anywhere capability. I mean, we have VMware, uh, Zen Server, KVM, Hyper-V. We have all the hypervisor covers. We have images in Amazon. We have other images available as well. So just about anywhere you need to recover, we can provide an image that will work. In this case, we're using Amazon S3 storage, so why not use Amazon Cloud at the same time? Spin up an appliance in the cloud. You can do that in minutes, single minutes, easily. We've saved that configuration file on the Cloud Array portal behind your user ID and password. Apply that configuration file to your appliance. Once you've done that, that appliance is fully functional again. Then bring up a file server. Once you bring up that file server, you will have access to your files. As soon as you mount that volume on your file server, you can present those volumes. Or bring up your backup server. Bring up your backup server, whatever it may be, and start firing, firing up your servers. Um, Amazon even has the capability then to take a VMDK file, for example, run it through a filter so that you can import that, and then bring that up in an Amazon Cloud environment. So there are steps in place here so that you can actually recover to the cloud. <clears throat> now with that in mind, I'm going to take you through some use cases. We've kind of been through the technology, but let's talk about how some of our customers have used this. One of the big things we do, we see a lot of, is eliminate tape. Um, customers are tired of tape drives, they're slow, they're unreliable, they're manual. There's a lot of reasons to not like them. And so we can certainly use this to eliminate tape. We've already discussed the disaster recovery capabilities, where in the event of a disaster, now you have access to your equipment images or to your files so that you can begin disaster recovery. Data archival, that's that archive model. In that particular case, we've got customers with hundreds of terabytes of data. They're using local on-premise storage that's very expensive, and they want to free that up. They're running out of room. So they're looking at the option now of buying more storage or finding a better way. And a better way is Amazon S3 storage. Same thing would work for capacity expansion. Same concept is in the archival. We can leverage the cloud to present local storage. That would include primary storage, by the way, down at the bottom. So I'm going to take you through a first of just three, there's only three, um, customer use cases. So with Mosaic, Mosaic was a customer that was using tape drives, and they wanted to eliminate tape. 
So in that environment, there's kind of like two steps to the process. The first thing they would want to do with Cloud Array, they're going to be backing up to a disk drive. It's a local backup to a local disk drive. So with that in mind, the first step is to migrate to an environment where you're backing up to a disk. And you can do these steps concurrently, by the way. So that, that first disk migration is going to be a Cloud Array disk. But there are some uh, paradigm shifts. There are some thought model changes that will need to take place as you move from a tape environment to a disk environment. Not the least of which, or perhaps the largest of which, is data deduplication. Um, that's seen in many forms. We do work with deduplication. So Backup Exec has a dedupe module. We recommend it. If you're using Veeam or Unitrends or AppAsure, they have synthetic full volume backups. We recommend that you use those. Because by doing that, you're going to minimize the amount of data that you need to store on that local volume, and thus you're going to minimize the amount of data that we're going to replicate to the cloud. Ideally, after that first full volume transfer, we're going to have an environment whereby the only data going across the wire is going to be the change rate, and we're going to compress that down to 50% of its original size. So in Mosaic's case, that's exactly what they did. They eliminated their tape. They now have a real-time on-site backup with an off-site copy of that. It cost them less money than it would have to replace their tape drives, their tape cartridges, etc. It's more reliable, and it's faster. So it was a win-win-win situation for Mosaic. O'Neill & Associates is similar. The only real difference in this is that in this case, they already had been backing up to disk, and they wanted to add the off-site cloud capabilities. So we just came in. We presented our appliance. Our, our appliance presented volumes then to that server, and that becomes the mechanism for deploying volumes, for using volumes, and for enhancing their storage experience on their premise. And because of that, it was much easier for them to provision volumes. They didn't have to worry about the storage pool from which they were pulling. They only had to worry about provisioning a volume, deciding the best characteristics for that, i.e. 10% cash, 100% cash, 1%, 25, 50, pick any number you'd like, provisioning of the volume accordingly, and giving that to their end users for use. Now, with Los Angeles Unified School District, the model was slightly different. In their environment, they had multiple remote sites. And these multiple remote sites were running out of storage. Some sites were, some sites weren't, et cetera, et cetera. You kind of know how that goes. They were, looked then, they were looking at the prospect of having to upgrade their storage on many of these sites. Instead, is what they did is they purchased Cloud Array appliances. They put those Cloud Array appliances, they used physical on some sites, they used virtual on other sites. The virtual appliance then can leverage that local storage pool for that local persistent storage. And yet, they can leverage the benefits of the cloud. They can expand into the cloud. There's that 10 to 1 ratio again. So that 10 to 1 cash to volume ratio means they can create a 10 terabyte volume, give that to their users, and consume only 1 terabyte locally, which dramatically increased their available storage. And it gave them a central management point. Our appliance is managed through a browser. Start a browser, point it at the appliance, and you can manage that appliance. So you can remote into those each of those sites, start a browser, point it at that appliance, and therefore management becomes a central site issue versus having to go out to a site, manage it, etc. Our appliance does come in multiple models, uh, virtual or physical. The virtual is listed in the leftmost column. Um, our appliance is essentially a one-time fee. You buy our appliance, and then you pay a monthly fee for the cloud storage. So it is a one-time fee. We, of course, have leasing options, monthly options to make it easier. Uh, with that in mind, we do not care how much cloud storage you use. Our appliance will address, theoretically, up to 50 petabytes. Um, and we don't charge based on that. We do, however, charge based on the local cache. So that local cache is that local persistent storage we have various stair steps. You can see 2612 Unlimited. In the virtual environment, you're bringing that storage. In the physical appliances, we will have installed that storage. You can see the general categories then of our physical appliances. Again, both have the exact same feature set. No difference. It's your deployment choice on how you would fit it into your environment. So on that note, we're going to move on to questions. So, uh, Lorita, you've been monitoring questions. Please. 
So um, as I mentioned before, our presenters will now take, our, take your questions. Uh, there is a questions panel on the uh, right side where your GoToMeeting console is. Please feel free to, uh, to enter them there. We have had a few that have already come in, Greg. Um, the first, you've talked a, lot, a little bit about Twinstrata um, for primary storage. Uh, one question that's come in is, does Twinstrata, does Twinstrata work as a primary storage platform on-premises? How does its performance compare with vendors such as EMC and NetApp? So, um, so with that in mind, um, first off, many of those products, such as NetApp, are file-based. Um, our performance is quite good. We can run pretty much at wire speed. Um, our appliance performs extremely well. Now, that does not, however, make it tier one storage. Uh, and in extreme IOPS environments, we probably want to, wouldn't want to use it. But for primary file storage, absolutely. Uh, it will compare favorably to these environments, particularly um, if you're going up a file server environment. Remember, we're iSCSI, so we're block-based. Um, and there are some inherent performance benefits with that. Um, now, with that in mind, typically to give files to your end user, our recommended model is that we go to an existing file server on-premise, we mount a volume that we've created, and then you share that volume with your end users. Um, however, next week we will be announcing the next release of our product where that NAS capability will be built in. So we will have a unified storage product that can do both block and file level sharing for your uses. The next question that I have here is actually for John Downey. Um, John, the question is, in our industry, we worry a lot about complying to regulatory requirements about data security and retention. How would you say that AWS helps us address, to address those needs? John, are you still on? So, lacking John, I will pick that up. We get that question quite a lot, PCI, uh, payment card industry, HIPAA, et cetera. Um, we are actually currently, in general, the Amazon has site security credentials, so they can show their compliance to all that. In addition, because we do the AES-256 on the appliance, we are also adding a layer to HIPAA compliance. Now, HIPAA compliance, for example, is larger than just the data storage. It has to do with access control, et cetera. But certainly, the data is kept in a secure method. And the keys are kept in your control, which are two very large access control then, two very large components of compliance. Greg, another one for you. Um, John mentioned a, a little bit about the ability to spin up a cloud array um, instance within the Amazon environment. How difficult is it to do that? Very simple. So essentially, um, John mentioned they have an AMI file that stands for Amazon Machine Image. So an AMI file is a uh, kind of a catalog entry. So you basically can go up to the Amazon environment, and within their catalog then, you can select Cloud Array Appliance and say start that appliance. And that appliance will start. Uh, you can either then, if you're starting from scratch, you can configure that. Or if you're using this for disaster recovery, you would apply our configuration file onto that image. Uh, another question that we have that actually is related to disaster recovery, um, can arrangements be made to have an appliance shift with data to reduce the time to transfer backup to systems by data transfer from the cloud? So specific to that question, I have to rephrase the question to make it more appropriate. Um, the concept is what we call bulk ingestion. Um, the idea is that sometimes a FedEx truck is going to be a better bandwidth option than is the wire. Um, we don't use it very often because there's no need because our appliance does everything in the background, so if you have to wait two weeks for the data to transfer, that typically doesn't matter. That said, it is certainly a viable option. So we have worked out arrangements with Amazon. They've been documented. They've been tested so that we can take an appliance. Uh, the best way to do it is to put an appliance on customer premise, turn off the cloud side of things, which is perfectly viable, set the bandwidth to zero, going to the cloud, copy the data to the appliance, and then pick it up, stick it in a box, put it on a FedEx truck, load it up at Amazon, open up the cloud side of the equation. We will dump all that information into the cloud. Once that's complete, we quiesce the box again, put it back away, ship it back to the customer site, and then power it back up again, and everything will take off normally. The data will have been flooded into the cloud, and the cache will still be flooded locally. 
Um, another question that we've gotten is, how is data backed up in AWS S3 uh, presented locally if we need to restore data that is backed up? Um, if I understand the question, it's Could you repeat that, please? Um, how is data backed up in AWS S3 presented locally if we need to restore data which is backed up? So I guess the locally, I mean, I have to assume that a complete disaster situation here, so where site A has been destroyed and now you want to recover um, an appliance, so and not in the cloud, you want to do it locally. So you would need to go to a, a place, a site, um, you would start a machine, load, say, ESXi on it, and then you would load our virtual appliance on it. This can be done in half an hour or less. You're going to need bandwidth at this point in time. And as a matter of fact, many of our customers are purchasing variable bandwidth options so that they can kind of turn that up. Once that's been done, we will be presenting those volumes. So next you'll bring up your server, your backup server. Call it backup exec. Go to your backup exec server, mount that volume, and you can use that to recover machines. Now, the key part of that question is probably the thought process. We present each of those volumes, and you can see across the entire volume. But of course, as you go to grab a file off of that, um, we'll grab it all opportunistically, i.e., we don't have to download the volume before we can do it. But Bandwidth will certainly play a huge role then on how quickly we can start spinning up machines. Um, nice in uh, say a Beam environment or Apisure, I know they do it in Unitrends. In the virtualized space, and actually I knew the new Backup Exec version 2012 does it as well. You can literally <laughs> mount that volume and essentially start booting off of the cloud. Um, so you don't have to download the whole VMDK file before you fire it up for virtual environments. Um, you can actually start booting it off of the cloud. And then we'll grab the blocks out of that VMDK file that we want and therefore bring it up. And if you've combined that with file level deduplication, machines 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera, will be much faster because a lot of the core files will be down already. Thanks, Greg. Um, I think that John Downey is back uh, online. John, there's a question here for you. What is the key difference between S3 and Glacier? Sure. Can you guys hear me OK? Yes. Yes. OK, excellent. Finally, sorry about that. Um, so they're, they're both object systems. Um, there are separate hardware platforms. Um, one is, so S3 is designed for um, a, a very wide variety of use cases. Um, it's, you know, synchronous in, synchronous out to the API. Um, and customers use S3 for, you know, production backend storage for web application data. Um, remote, off-site, backup, archive, DR storage for scenarios like this. There's a very wide variety of use cases and performance capabilities for S3. So it's going to be about a magnitude more expensive than Glacier. Uh, but it also has a tiered pricing structure. So as you put more data into S3, their costs come down per gig per month. Um, so it's synchronous in, synchronous out, higher performance object storage, if you will. When you look at Glacier, <coughs> Glacier is designed to be uh, more of a, a, a long-term cold storage repository. Think of it as uh, an archive in the cloud to replace tape. Uh, its cost is a penny per gig per month. It is synchronous in, meaning your application, or in the future, some backup software, or archive software, or a, a cloud gateway of some sort can write into Glacier synchronously in but when it requests data out, or when your application requests a retrieval of older data, there's going to be roughly a three and a half to five hour wait time. So we have, obviously, a different API for Glacier. Uh, we have uh, you know, SDKs available for Glacier. And we also have, uh, native to Amazon Web Services, our notification services, so that when you go to retrieve something in Glacier, um, we'll essentially send back a, a little ticket to the application and then notify that application when the data has been staged and ready to be pulled back out. So Glacier is a flat tiered uh, flat structure versus S3, which is a tiered cost structure. Glacier, regardless of how much data you put in it, is a penny per gig per month. You still get 11 nines of durability with Glacier as you do with S3. And it probably makes sense for me to also explain that we have uh, a third thing coming out very soon that's actually um, you know, publicly stated. 
uh, we're building a tiering mechanism between S3 and Glacier also. So if you're, uh, if you're a customer that writes to S3 today, regardless of the use case, you will be able to use tiering mechanisms to move older data out of S3 that's no longer accessed frequently into Glacier, and we can do that automatically within Amazon. So you're really looking at a total of three products, S3 native, and then with S3 you have standard storage and reduced redundancy storage. Standard is more parity overhead, more expensive, 11 nines of durability. Reduced redundancy storage in the world of S3 is four nines of, of durability, less parity overhead, lower cost, about a 30 to 33% delta. So with S3 you have two different flavors from a durability perspective, given how much parity we do. Then you've got Glacier, which is the penny per gig per month, only that one cost, regardless of capacity, meant to be long-term cold storage tape replacement type archives. That's number two. And then number three, you have the tiering mechanism, which will come out soon, within weeks, which will drain older objects out of S3 into Glacier on a per account basis to lower your costs. Great. Thank you, John. Um, actually, speaking of, of Glacier, Greg, can you uh, let us know whether or not uh, Twinstrata currently connects to Glacier? Right. Today we can't connect to Glacier. We're an online volume, for so to speak, and so therefore the latency of three to five hours would create problems, i.e. we'd exceed our high SCSI timeouts, whatever the case may be. We have to respond in a certain period of time. Uh, that said, our engineering team is looking into uh, Glacier and how we can craft our solution to be able to encompass that as well. Um, for example, we have snapshot capability. Perhaps we could leverage snapshots um, and be able to mount a snapshot that could do that, et cetera. So we are um, looking at ways that we can do that. Currently, no, because we're on online volume. Um, we're getting to the top of the hour. I'm going to leave one more question that's just come in, and then we'll probably end. Um, this question is in regards to file compression on the cloud storage. In our industry, we work, relay, and store uncompressed footage. Compressing this material can be, as detri uh, can be detrimental to our final product. How much compression, if any, is implemented once it's transferred to the cloud? So on our appliance, we um, do byte-level deduplication. It's a standard compression algorithm. However, if you don't want that, so for example, the question re regarding video files. Um, video files are already compressed pretty heavily. Um, you can easily create volumes. Actually, it's done at the account level. So you'd create a second Amazon Cloud account. It's not, or I said that wrong. On the appliance, you use the same credentials. But as you use that same credential, so same storage pool, you could create then the ability to create volumes that had no compression assigned to them. So you can easily create volumes with no compression using our appliance to, to alleviate that. Other than that, it is standard um, compression utilities that we use, uh, typically 28 to 50 percent, although I will categorically state video files will not compress that well. And on, the AWS, um, and on the AWS side, we do not do compression natively. Um, that is something that you'd have to do to the data prior to transmission. Um, and just one quick note on, on video and file storage is that many customers will put mezzanine files on S3 standard and then run some sort of transcoding process within Amazon Web Services and then put those transcoded or encoded copies on RRS. So if you ever lose that one copy because it's a lower parity, you can just go back to S3, pull it back out, retranscode, and put it back into RRS. So something to think about there. But we do not natively do compression on our system. Thank you, John. Um, I'm afraid we have run out of time. I'd like to extend a special thanks to John Downey, Mark, and Greg for sharing their insights and expertise. We do have a couple of other questions that we didn't have time to get to, so we'll get to those after the uh, um, after the event directly to you. Um, and thanks to our audience for attending Get Rid of Your Backup and Archive Headaches. We hope that you found today's conversation informative and useful. Thank you for attending, and this concludes today's webinar.